Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, if no more questions, thank you, Brigitte, very much. And uh, I'd like to call Martin Shaw from DECO. He's going to talk about biomarkers. This is the... Okay. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you for sharing your time with me today. I much appreciate it. We've heard a lot about um, toxicology biomarkers early on, and I'm because it's an expensive and important part of drug development. And even so, drugs are failing very late on and even post launch at the cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm going to describe to you some of the newer biomarkers that could possibly and probably reduce this waste and get us far, not faster drugs to market, but get them there more cost effectively. I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem very quickly, then something about hepatotoxicity biomarkers for cell leakage, then some more biomarkers for apoptosis and necrosis, a bit about nephrotoxicity, and then importantly about how you can combine biomarkers for better results, and then a very quick review and some questions. Why do we need them? We need to simplify testing, can strengthen decision making, more data, better decisions. They provide mechanistic information, and we heard earlier on how important that is. And because of all this, they reduce costs, and in particular, they reduce costs by reducing late stage failures. The mantra is fail them early, fail them cheap before you've invested in these compounds. So, first of all, we can talk about hepatotoxicity, detecting, monitoring, and predicting it using novel biomarkers. And I'm going to talk about three different biomarkers. First of all, alpha GST, which is a marker for cell leakage. And then keratin 18, which is a cell structural protein as a marker of necrosis. And then keratin 18, which is a marker of apoptosis. And I'm going to present them both in in vitro and in human studies. This is alpha GST. It's found specifically in hepatocytes in enormous concentrations, about 10% of the protein and is very rapidly re released when the cells are damaged. And then it rapidly disappears from the serum. Looking at a couple of examples, this is for in vitro. How do I get the... How do I get the pointer? I'm trying to get the pointer to come on. Ah, what have I done? What's happened to the screen? Okay. Okay. Now, you see, this is looking also about multifactorals, as mentioned earlier. This is looking at cell culture, three-dimensional cell culture, so you get a better biological model exposed to a toxic medidrone. And you can see here that as the dose increases, the metabolism of the cell decreases by the lack of uh, decreased ATP production. But at the same time, the increase, as the toxicity increases, and you get a release of alpha-GST as the membrane is disturbed. In this particular case, they, the, two model, the two biomarkers give quite somewhat similar information, but looking at other biomarkers like rotenone, you get a dis, discordance between these, and these provide you information on the mechanism of damage. Where is the damage occurring? This is the, the classic clinical model of hepatotoxicity, paracetamol overdose. And this is a stylized picture of the way biomarkers change in patients who have done this. They, there's a very early release of alpha GST from the hepatocytes. Terry may. There's a very early release of GST from hepatocytes, which goes up by a factor you can see 10,000 fold before declining. The traditional biomarkers, which are basically liver enzymes, that's, and in this case it's al alanine transaminase, don't start to go up until later. It's very easy to treat paracetamol by giving a, an antioxidant called N-acetylcysteine. And if that's given, then the alpha GST falls very, very rapidly. So you get very good confidence that the patient is getting better. The more traditional biomarkers take much longer to go down, so you have a, a zone of uncertainty. So to summarize this, you get much better kinetics. When it's up, it's up, it's down, it's down, and you can see the rate of change. So looking at this as a lipotoxicity biomarker, you get a lot of background. It's not there when it's not there. You get a relationship to dose, clearer kinetics, and in general, clearer results. Looking at, so that's one mechanism of cell death. Looking at a 
another method, apoptosis necrosis. This is based on the measurement of cytoresis cytokeratins. And these are structural proteins released from dying cells. And in necrosis, you could say uncontrolled cell death, the intact cytoskeleton is released and called K18. And this is measured using an antibody called M65 in an, an, an assay called M65 ELISA. In apoptosis, the cytokeratin is degraded before it's released, it's digested. And so you get then caspase cleaved cytokeratin. And this is measured using another antibody called M30 ELISA. Looking at, first of all, in vitro, here's a, a, a study shown again, the different methodology. Here you have a vitality biomarker. As it shows declines, you can see that the, the cells are dying. But you see the mechanism of cell death can be seen here. If you look at 0.3, apoptosis is occurring, but not necrosis. But when you get to 1, both are occurring. So by looking at the combination, you can see what is happening earlier and more specifically, apologies, you can see earlier, more specifically, you can see that when it's a lower dose, it's apoptosis, more controlled cell death, and a higher dose, it's more dramatic necrosis. Transposing that into the human studies, once again, it's paracetamol. And it's one of the most hepatotoxic drugs on the market. And here you have the traditional biomarkers, alanine, aminotransferase, and these are subjects who do not go, who, who remain healthy. They do not go into the liver failure. These are subjects who show a great increase in the release of liver proteins, ALT. And so these are the subjects who need clinical active help. And there's no difference in the release at presentation between the ALT. So at presentation, the traditional biomarkers cannot predict who is going to go on into liver failure. If you look at the necrosis biomarker, M65, at presentation, these are the subjects who remain healthy, and these are the subjects who are going to liver failure. So you can predict at presentation what is going to happen. So by combining them, you get information as to the mechanism of cell death. They're more sensitive, detection and monitoring. You have a greater chance injury will be detected, and you can detect the injury at lower doses. That's for the liver. Going on to the other main organ group that's uh, affected by toxicity, that's the kidney, nephrotoxicity. And we have a, a, a wide range of biomarkers which cover different parts of the nephron. The nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. So we can measure the glomerulus, the proximal tubule, the distal tubule, and we can measure the inflammatory and recovery response of the kidney to, with the generation of new biomarkers. I'm going to talk about alpha GST, pi GST, and then these two biomarkers, KIM1 and NGAL, because these are the best validated uh, biomarkers in nephrotoxicity. So first I'm going to talk about urinary glutathione transferases as necrosis biomarkers, and then the recovery biomarkers, and then their combination. So these are the GSTs in the cell, in the kidney. This is alpha GST in the proximal tubular part of the kidney. This is the part of the kidney that is mostly affected by toxins. Here you have the pi GST in the distal tubules of the kidney. That is a part affected more rarely by toxins, but the effect tends to be more severe. So looking at a, a, a toxin that affects the proximal tubule, this is a... Uh, aminoglycoside, that's a well-known antibiotic, which is a known nephrotoxin. And here you see the release of the, uh, the protein from the proximal tubules. But the traditional biomarker of renal injury, serum creatinine, doesn't change very much. So you, this would be missed using traditional biomarkers, but the modern biomarkers show it very clearly. This is a, Foscana is an antiviral drug, which is a distal tubular toxin. And here you can see that it takes a while for the to kick in, but then it rockets. The release goes up by a factor of 30. And then once they've stopped therapy, it goes down again. So you see it going up and going down. These are the traditional biomarkers which show a much slower rate of change. They also measured alpha GST and other biomarkers, and they did not change. Did so we could specifically identify where in the kidney this is happening. So if you look at these GSTs, you get a lower background. You get relation to dose, you get clear kinetics, 
strong negative activity values, and clear results again. So the point is you, these are so specific and sensitive that you have a strong base to make decisions. Moving on to some other biomarkers, uh, NGAL is a modern one very recently developed. It's a marker of renal inflammation. It binds and uh, redistributes iron, which is in the urine. And there's also kidney injury molecule 1, which is produced and it coats naked membranes and makes it easier for the cells to repopulate the damaged parts of the kidney. So looking at like the GSTs and these other ones, you can, get, you can do some very neat studies. If the injury biomarkers are elevated and the recovery biomarkers are normal, you have very early injury. If both are elevated, injury is occurring. And if only recovery elevators are elevated, then the injury is resolving. So here's a study in rats showing this. They're given the dose here, and this is the alpha GST showing cell death. And it goes up and clears away. Here's the recovery biomarker showing cell regeneration. And that goes on for several days. So you can see very clearly the effect of this substance on the, the rat kidney. Now you couldn't biopsy the kidney every day, or, or you could maybe kill five rats this day, five rats that day, five days that day to do the picture. But by looking at these release of these biomarkers into the urine, you can take sequential samples from a small group of animals and see exactly what is happening. So, studying biomarkers is a challenge, but better biomarkers can help to meet it. The biomarkers that we have at the moment are these ones, uh, alpha and pi GSTs I mentioned, KIM1, NGAL, FABP, collagen 4, M30, M65. These study the liver and the kidney for in vitro and human. They're all being evaluated at the moment by the Safety I Immunative Medicines Initiative for new biomarkers. And the data should be published at the end of this year. And that will be a great step forward in making these available to the general industry. I've presented to you that Toxicity is a problem, but one of the advantages of nanotechnology is that you can target therapy and you can reduce off-target off effects. And there are at least two known nephrotoxic drugs, cyclosporin and amphotericin B, where it has been shown by combining these drugs into liposomes, nanotechnology, they can reduce nephrotoxicity. So you can show that your drug is better than brand X by measuring sensitive toxicity biomarkers. It can be a positive thing as well. So thanks for listening to me. I hope I'll give you an idea of the advantage you can get by going early to modern biomarkers and how it can save you money because you pick up the losers early, get rid of them, and also show how your technology is better. So thanks very much. Brilliant or unintelligible. Okay. Uh, m maybe I have a question. Uh, if you had the choice, um, which um, biomarker to add to the standard battery of uh, clinical tests nowadays uh, in hospitals, which would be your choice? Um, I think the problem in the hospital is that there's no, uh, the doctors don't know what to do. They don't know how to do this. They are, they have their their treatment protocols linked to. Uh, the traditional biochemistry test. So if you look at what I'm saying, I, I would very much go in for looking at these uh, alpha GSTs in liver and kidney disease and KIM1 in kidney disease. Because what they do is they give the doctor more real time. I, I could have shown pictures from the clinic where these tests show within a few minutes or hours to the doctor what is happening. Like you, you give a patient a treatment for hepatitis C and the next day you can see the kidney, how the liver has changed or a patient comes in with paracetamol overdose and you want to know is he dying or is he going to get better, you can tell in a few minutes, sorry, uh, if it, within a few hours of the overdose what his prognosis is. So I think that these sort of biomarkers are the things, but really you should say, okay, what cell type is affected in this disease and what biomarker will tell me what is happening to that cell type? So it's not one size fits all. It is a case of looking at the disease and choosing the biomarker according to that disease. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Okay.
All right, then um, the next speaker is Dr. Uh, Professor 